Welcome, and uh, I want to thank you all for coming out and braving the Seattle traffic for this uh, first in a, in a uh, series of panels. And I also want to start uh, with a special thank you to our panelists in favor of the $15 an hour wage increase. Uh, it's hard enough for people to speak in public, and it's much harder when you're coming before a crowd you largely disagree with. So I want to put a special thank you out uh, to them. Uh, first, I want to address my bias. I am the moderator today, and some people might be thinking, wait a second, that's the guy who hosts the morning show. I know he has strong opinions. Well, my goal is uh, to encourage a lively, informative, and passionate discussion. Uh, it may at times get heated, but uh, my objective is to make sure it doesn't get mean-spirited. Um, when Britt Hume was an anchor at ABC News, uh, he said that everybody in the media has a bias. The problem is they refuse to recognize it. So I recognize that I have a bias, uh, but in order to accommodate for that as moderator tonight, I've drawn questions from materials presented uh, by the $15 an hour minimum wage hike advocates and requested suggestions from a liberal perspective, including that of our sister station, 97.3 uh, Cairo FM. Uh, host Dave Ross kindly provided me with some suggestions this evening. So uh, you will hear I will try and adopt uh, a, a liberal perspective when I am questioning uh, Ben Shapiro and Paul Guppy, and I will try and adopt a more conservative perspective when I'm questioning our other panelists. So. Two producers in the audience, Chris Martin, and, and my own producer, Nicole, if they're here, uh, we couldn't get up so early and do all these things without them. So if you catch them, uh, thank them for making that uh, possible. <laughs> now our participants. Uh, first up, Deputy Director of the National Employment Law Project, Rebecca Smith. Next, the Vice President for Research at the Washington Policy Center, Paul Guppy. <laughs> Seattle City Councilwoman Shama Sawant. <laughs> and best selling author, columnist, editor, and KGTH Afternoon Drive host, Ben Shapiro. For the first portion of this event, I'll ask questions of the panelists designed to broaden into larger discussions. Each question will be directed to a specific panelist who will have uh, at most a couple of minutes to answer, followed by observations and counterpoints made from other panelists. I'll try to keep uh, the conversation relatively relaxed, um, but occasionally I may have to intervene to move things along. And again, I do alternate the questions. However, I did want to start uh, with this, number one, first of all. Can we all at least agree uh, that we would like to see people earning more and see less poverty? Not the most controversial question. Everybody agrees, starting with agreement. Is that the debate right there? Excellent, right there. <laughs> I think we've solved everything. Have a good evening. <laughs> question uh, number one. Uh, some people making below $15 an hour, and this is directed to you, Ben. Some people making below $15 an hour make ends meet by receiving government benefits in the form of food stamps and or other subsidies. Some assert that this essentially means governments have enabled businesses to pay less and keep more for their bottom lines, resulting in subsidized corporate profits and people more dependent on government. Ben Shapiro, as a conservative who advocates for less dependency on government, why do you object to this reasoning? I don't object to that reasoning. I think it's 100% true. I think the, the, the major problem that we have with regard to food stamps supplementing people's wages is that these companies are being paid off by the government. I mean, they, they're getting enormous subsidies from the federal government in the form of food stamps. And there are two ways that you can correct that in terms of, ter in terms of wages. The, the, the first way that you can correct that in terms of wages would be with a, a measure like the minimum wage, which, as we'll argue about tonight, uh, decreases, in my opinion, employment. The evidence, I believe, tends to show that it decreases employment, or at the very least puts a cap on it and makes it more difficult for small businesses to operate while big businesses are still getting these subsidies. Um, and, uh, and second of all, it creates, uh, it creates a, a corrupt system where certain businesses benefit 
more than others. The, 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 the second way that you're going to be able to prevent all of this is, is if you cut back a lot of these subsidies, forcing businesses to compete for labor. Labor is just like any other good in a free market. That means that people have to compete for it. So if you want wages to go up, then get rid of the government paying the other half of the wage. And you will see the, the, the wages automatically increase. I, you know, I think that we should all be able to agree on the idea that wages need to increase. I think the difference is that the way to make wages increase is to have a fully consensual relationship between employer and employee. And I think this is really the root of the morality of minimum wage when it comes down to it. And in, in two sentences here is that I would never force an employee to work for an employer at a given wage. That violates the 13th Amendment and constitutes slavery or indentured servitude. Um, by the same token, I would never force an employer to pay a given wage to an employee because that is a lack of consent on the part of the employer and violates basic principles of fairness as well as freedom. Let's hear from the... <laughs> let's, let's hear from the other side. Would either of you like to address that question? Sure. So I think uh, we, have, we can agree on certain uh, ground realities in this economy. Ben is completely right. Big business is gaining at the expense of small business. That is true. And if you look at uh, who, who are the workers we are talking about, who are the low wage workers, who are the people who would benefit from an um, increase in minimum wage, we have to step back and understand that this is a problem of inequality. And uh, the reality is that nearly half of the people who uh, are eligible for food stamps and who actually exercise their right to get it are working people not lazy people who sit at home. This is what we often think about. But the reality is that they are working people. They, are, they need that subsidy because they don't make enough money. So in reality, all the money that you and I pay as taxpayers in order to fund these welfare programs are not subsidizing workers. They're subsidizing Walmart in order to enable them to pay very low wages. So this is really you paying a subsidy to a giant corporation that is making massive profits. And the businesses that gain the most by having workers at low wages are big businesses. If you look at local businesses and small businesses, they do rely on workers and people, consumers who live in the neighborhoods, having a little bit more income than their basic needs to be able to go and buy goods and services at local businesses. So if you look at all the minimum wage increases that have happened in different places, it's small businesses that benefit from them because they now have consumers that can actually pay for them. And as far as the cons consensual relationship is concerned, the $15 an hour struggle is not something that is coming uh, from the White House or from some big government. It is workers at the bottom saying that they can't live on, uh, on uh, really a low wage. And they are saying, they are coming out in movements and saying that they need a living wage. And it's their right because they are the ones who make the city run. Paul, do you, do you agree with uh, Ben's reasoning? Well, the, the point about this that's always been interesting to me is that it, the reason I guess we agree across the board that uh, programs like food stamps end up subsidizing companies is because that's a mechanism that actually works. The question is, I mean, that actually happens. The question is, why does that happen? So what it seems to me is strange is when policymakers create a program which creates a legal entitlement, people take advantage of the entitlement, that has an effect on subsidizing wages for the employers, that's true, and then that program is criticized. So that's a case of policy analysis of where Congress needs to look at the program and see what are the unintended fallout effects in the economy of providing subsidies for people that also create the problem of dependency. So we're going to be debating here uh, quite a bit about earned income and work and how that leads to independence and that's what really lifts people out of poverty, not continued subsidies through uh, programs that the government has provided. So I think the problem is in the structure of those programs and how they affect the labor market. Rebecca, would you like to add? I would. I want to say thanks first for having us here to have what is a reasoned and impassioned debate. And it's really, being in a more hostile audience for me is really not very different than having dinner with my relatives. So it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Are we related? Try being a conservative. <laughs> yeah, try being a conservative Jew. So, <laughs> Bloomberg News described Walmart and McDonald's as the biggest welfare queens in the country. 
we are subsidizing Walmart and McDonald's and other huge employers that are making record profits to the tune of about $3.8 billion a year. I think we, agree, we disagree, though, on how to make that change. Um, if we did increase the minimum wage here to $15 an hour, a family of three that is now receiving food stamps would receive near zero in food stamps. And that would relieve you and me from paying for those benefits. It sounds to me like what you all are talking about is sort of going back to before 1938, before we had any sort of public assistance programs and before we had minimum wage. And to me, that really raises the specter of kids working in mines and people dying on the job because there are no rules. Bring back the 1890s. I can't, I, I can't really believe that that's where you're going. You're correct that it's not where we're going. I want to go there. I have a 10-month-old. Can't I put her to work? A 10-week-old. Can I put her to work yet? You know, what's the problem? <laughs> she needs to start earning. Come on. All right. We're, we're bound to cover some of that ground as the questions progress. So let's move on to question number two. Uh, Council Member Sawant. Um, Walmart has expressed a willingness to support a minimum wage increase so long as it pertains to all businesses. Uh, most of the opposition to the 15 now seems to come from smaller companies rather than large corporations. Does the $15 an hour wage favor large business interests over their potential rivals? Yes. <laughs> it is true that the face of the opposition to $15 an hour has been small businesses, but the reality is that the force behind this is the elephant in the room, which is big business. We're always stuck in this sort of, uh, you know, circular logic of, you know, how small businesses are going to be affected. And let's look at the data, you know, let's get away from uh, emotions and feelings and let's look at what's happened in the past when minimum wage was increased. And I'm not talking about 100 years ago, I'm talking about what's happened since 2003 in many different cities. And what you see is an overwhelming evidence that uh, small businesses gain, local businesses gain when workers, when consumers around them have more money in their pockets to be able to spend on extras, you know, little extras. We're not talking about being able to pay your rent. It's absolutely essential to be able to pay your rent, especially in a city like Seattle. But who are the people who gain from uh, basic need payments like paying your rent? It's big developers. It's not small businesses that gain. Small businesses gain when they have a little, ec when uh, households have a little extra after they have paid for their basic needs. And why is it that they gain when the lowest paid workers uh, have a little more money in their pockets? They gain that because the lowest paid workers, and we're talking about 100,000 workers in Seattle, this is not a small number, they can only spend in local businesses because they don't have the money to fly off to Paris for a vacation. So it's no use giving more money to already rich people. They're not going to come and spend and they're not going to buy more from your businesses because they've already bought what they need and the rest of the cash that they have is sitting in their bank accounts or they're making massive real estate investments somewhere else, not in Seattle. So if you want to benefit businesses in Seattle, actually disproportionately more than big business, it should. I mean, if you care about small businesses, I appeal to you to join me in fighting for a higher minimum wage because that is what will benefit small businesses. Okay, the, okay. Ben, do you want to respond to that? Does, does the minimum wage, does it favor, does the minimum wage increase favor large businesses over their potential rivals? I mean, of, of course it does. And, and folks, if you're not asked the question, please don't answer it. Um, as far as the, um, you know, as, as far as does it favor big businesses over small businesses, the answer is of course it does. The reason big businesses are big business is because they have economies of scale, which allow them to absorb an increase in cost in a way that small businesses simply can't. If you have three employees, it's going to be a lot harder for you to absorb a 60% increase in your cost bottom line than it is for a company like McDonald's, which has economies of scale across the entire nation. Uh, I think there's a general point to be made here, you know, with regard to, and maybe we'll get to it later, so maybe I'm jumping the gun, with regard to income inequality, you know, we've, we've labeled that a problem. I don't believe that income inequality as a moral matter is a basic problem because I don't care if people are rich. I think there are too many poor people. That's not a problem of equality, that's a problem of poverty. We and actually so, will be speaking about that earlier, so. One more thing, while I, I uh, enjoy the enthusiasm, we'll move through the questions faster. If you could hold applause 
uh, and or jeers to the, uh, to the end of the round of the question, like when I say, all right, we're going to move to the next question, that will make it so that we'll be able to move through uh, more questions and explore more issues. Um, so, Paul, any so, comments? So to add to this point, and again, it may, it, in a way it builds on the way that federal programs end up sub subsidizing big business. The same is true of the minimum wage, because any time that the government imposes a cross-the-board mandate on the economy, those organizations which are best positioned to game the system or gain advantages or have lobbyists or exercise power with the government, and that's big businesses, they're always going to find a way to come out ahead. So the more that the government tries to create fairness or equality by interfering in the economy, changing the rules of the game, corporations are always going to have an advantage. And a minimum wage privileges large businesses and also online businesses, making it even harder for the Main Street retailer to compete because people just look for alternatives online or someplace else. Rebecca, I'll give you the last word on this. It's really hard for me to understand that big business is so privileged by the minimum wage because the big companies are paying some of the lowest wages. And in fact, two thirds of the low wage workers in the, this country are working for businesses of 100 people or more. So I, I guess I just don't understand what it is you, you so how it privileges big business. What are their the reality on? is, and the proof of uh, that the minimum wage works for everybody is that there had been dozens of studies, and we'll talk about this later, I'm sure, that look at all business, and business does fine after a minimum wage is increased. And this is why, because business, as Shama said early, earlier, depends on consumers. So if we raise wages, people who don't have money now have money to spend. And low-wage workers spend money locally at, for things that are food and clothes. And maybe they save for education. They're not buying expensive uh, trips. They're not spending money like rich folks that you know are making so much money they couldn't spend it in an entire lifetime. They're spending it in local businesses. Local businesses get customers. They do well. They hire more people. So raising the minimum wage is essential to our eco economic recovery. And Rebecca's point brings us directly to the next question. There you go. Henry Ford's increase in wages for his assembly line workers is often cited as evidence for increasing wages for the sake of economic activity, some of which Rebecca just described. Following that logic, logic Paul Guppy, from an economic perspective, regardless of someone's skill level or work ethic, don't we need more customers with money to spend so that people who do have a work ethic can make a buck and have a better customer base? Okay, great point. Okay, so in 1913 in Detroit, a new industry, the automotive industry, there were literally dozens of auto manufacturers at the time. And turnover in the auto industry was tremendous. One of the things that Henry Ford was trying to accomplish was stop the turnover. If he could just get his skilled workers to stay for at least a year, that would create stability in his business, and that actually ended up working. So he uh, proposed the $5 a day uh, wage, which he did voluntarily, by the way. So that was a competitive business decision that he made. It wasn't imposed on him. He voluntarily offered it, and the best workers voluntarily accepted it. It was a business model that worked in that industry at the time. You fast forward to today, we're talking about imposing a mandate, and we can get into the morality of whether the government should uh, interfere between a willing job offer and a person who's willing to work at that wage. The thing about 15 now is it makes 14 dollars uh, an hour illegal immediately. And you're not allowed to work at that wage even if you want to. Uh, moving forward to today, we live in an economy that's much more competitive where consumers have choices. So in a way, the 15 now movement is more like the Bellevue Square enrichment movement. Because consumers will, as prices rise in Seattle in response, people will move to other areas in the region to do their shopping, or more likely is they'll go online. So the uh, Queen Anne bookstore, which is trying to compete against Amazon, is immediately going to be put at a disadvantage. Um, Rebecca, why don't you respond? Sure, two points. This question of a willing worker and a willing employer, I don't think anyone can seriously argue that um, individuals who are working for McDonald's or Walmart have the power to negotiate their wage with their employer. 
Um, I think most people the here has probably the power to put them out of work. I think, well, not true. <laughs> the second question, and really, wage and worth is all about power. Um, if workers can band together and can a demand a certain wage and can meet the power of an employer, fine. But workers who are working hard are falling behind and their jobs are worthy. Is it really, you know, we can talk about whether people are worth $15 an hour, but is the CEO of Walmart worth 20 million a year? Really? Is, really? Really, you believe that? Hold on. <laughs> No, it's, okay. I want Second to encourage, question. If, if you have some conversation between you, I don't want it to be so formal that you feel like you can't interject or discuss with one okay. another. Second question, section, second issue about turnover and morale in Henry Ford. That was true in Henry Ford's day, but it's true today as well. Um, if you look at the studies about the minimum wage, when the minimum wage goes up, there are huge benefits to business. There is less turnover. People show up to work, less absenteeism. There's more great morale. When I get a wa raise wage, raise wage raise, I know I feel a lot better. Um, people have less grievances. There are less disciplinary problems. People take care of, of machinery better. So things are better now when people get a, min a minimum wage increase, just as they were in Henry Ford's day. Council member? Well, I think we have to. Uh you know, step back and see that, you know, look around the, you know, look at the world around us, look at your own lives. Uh, I would bet that the majority of the audience here is not billionaires or not even millionaires. I would bet that just have jobs, you know, you have to show up to work in order to earn your livelihood. And I think that, you know, you, uh, you have to acknowledge the reality, regardless of your, which end of the ideological spectrum you're on, that this idea that the relationship between uh, a corporation and a, a worker is an entirely voluntary one is a figment of our imagination. The reality is that the relationship depends upon the balance of power. Because if you were to really believe that it's to, totally a voluntary relationship, then you, you should be arguing for child labor because that was legal at one time and that was argued as a beneficial nice. thing for the economy. And People had to fight against that. People who were outraged uh, and uh, absolutely morally, we're talking about morality, right? People who are morally disgusted at the idea of their children being put to work instead of having childhoods had to fight against it. They had to organize mass movements around it. We're so moving, we have to understand that so it's a balance of power. slightly away from whether we need uh, customers with more money to have that, um, uh, that base, but we'll be addressing some of the um, underage working here shortly. Ben. Yeah, Your I mean, I'll, I'll refrain from, from talking about child labor, especially given the fact that the, the rationale for child labor laws is that children are incapable of consent, right? I mean, that's, that's the rationale Although for child labor Although your child laws. did appear on television last night. She did, I without think. her consent. So. But I will, and I will tell you that she immediately joined SAG the, after. The rationale for child labor to be legal was that ch children are exploitable, more exploitable. That's why businesses wanted it, and people had to fight well, against isn't it. it. Businesses may want it, but the fact is that the children are not capable of consent, which is why the legislation was appropriate from all ideological points of view. In terms of, in terms of whether, the, basically this trickle-up economics, this idea that if you pay people $15 an hour, it will help the general economy, it, it's, it's evidencing a, a differential point of view with regard to how money is invested and what makes your life as a consumer better. The truth is, the truth is, that you know, Mother Teresa did less good for the world than Bill Gates, as a general matter. Because more people gained their jobs through Bill Gates, more people have a product that Bill Gates created, more people's lives have been bettered through Bill Gates. Mother Teresa did a lot of wonderful things. But the reality of the situation is that what makes your life better than people's lives were 50 years ago is all the new products and services developed by all the rich people who hire you. All of you out there who I'm sure are not rich, are you working for a poor person right now? Who is hiring you? Who's paying your salary? Unless you're working for the government, and even then you're not, paying, you're not working for a poor person, you're paying for the rich people who actually pay the taxes that pay for you to work for the government. So this idea that economic growth is a function of people making $15 an hour versus $14 an hour is simply not true. The, re the reality of the situation is that what makes the economy grow is new products and services that make your life better and which require millions of dollars in research and development. And as far as the point that was made about the salary of the CEO of Walmart, 
All I can say is this. See, the Walmart has approximately, they're the biggest employer in the country. They have something on the order of, of 2 million employees across the country. Let, let's say we agree that 20 million is too much. And let's say that we cut that salary to zero. Great, we just gave everybody 10 bucks, right, for the year. So let's, let's stop pretending that the, the vast wealth imbalance inside Walmart is causing poverty for people at the bottom. Actually, uh, I I'm think gonna, the I'm statistic gonna... is that Walmart could cut its profits ever so slightly and raise everybody's wages much higher than they are now because they're making so much money. Well, then people can go to another employer. And this gets back to the voluntariness point, but I know that David's got a question about that. Right. Well, I was going to use my prerogative as a former Walmart employee, but no, since, that's been taken, <laughs> since that's been taken care of. Uh, let's move on to the next question here. This is for Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca, teens just entering the market have low skills, no training, no experience, and most are not supporting a family. Should teens be exempted from any move toward a $15 an hour minimum mandate? No, they should not. Is that it? <laughs> no. <laughs> when, when there have been studies of minimum wage effects on teens, and that's partly where we're going here, um, there has been no loss in teen employment either when there has been an increase in minimum wage. And, well, as a mother of four kids who uh, put themselves partly through college and now have huge debts, I don't think it's such a terrible thing to pay a 17-year-old $15 an hour for a few hours of work a week so that that kid can save for college and uh, maybe even volunteer for a good cause in their, in their uh, free time when they're not working for their $15 hour minimum wage. Doesn't make sense to me. Council it's Member, again a subsidy for large business. Council Member Sawant, do you still feel that uh, teens should not be exempted from the $15 an hour now movement? Well, I think that all these questions that are brought up by detractors of a livable wage are red herrings in many ways. If you look at the demographics of the population that uh, would benefit from $15 an hour, if you look at the 100,000 workers in Seattle who would benefit from it, a very, very small proportion of them are teenagers. The reality is that the majority of them are older people, you know, in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, sometimes they're, they're stuck for a lifetime in low-wage jobs. And those are the people we're talking about benefiting. And as far as teenagers are concerned, let's be honest, that's not, it's, it's not, it's, it's this, this idea that the teenagers who work at minimum wage jobs are uh, young people who come from privileged households and are just there for pocket money does not, is not representative of most teenagers who are at work. Most teenagers are at work because they support their families because their parents and the people they live with are making such low wages that the household requires more than one person to go to work, more than two sometimes to go to work in order to put a roof over their heads. And that's the reality. And you know, I think we have to, we have, to have a, a, a larger sense of what we're talking about here. You know, the, the, the word that was thrown out earlier was dependency. That's a great word to focus on. Who are the dependents in this economy if you look at the numbers and the amount of work that is being done? Think about Boeing. Boeing executives got a giant handout of $9 billion last year. The state legislature went into special session to give them that. When was the last time the state legislature went into special session to give subsidies to small businesses or working people? The reality is that the biggest dependency relationship in our economy is from working people to the big corporations, from working people to the CEOs. So it's not a trickle down, it's a gushing up. We will be, the tea party? We'll, we'll, we will be um, addressing some of, this. we'll be addressing <laughs> some of the, uh, the corporate issues coming up. Um, you said, what was it, join the, uh, I said, when did you join the tea actually, party? Actually, I mean, the fact that he mentioned the tea party is very interesting. Because the rise of the Tea Party, for whatever short period that it happened, it reflected a basic frustration. Huh, and hold on. <laughs> I knew they would get a response. <laughs> it, it, no, the, the reality is that a lot of people, whether they identify as right or left, that's a different story. The reality is that the vast majority of the American population is disgusted 
with the political dysfunction of the two parties. 60% of Americans recently said that they're fed up with the two-party system, they're fed up with the way things are, and they want things to change. And there is a lot of, lot of, a lot of real frustration that a lot of people are talking about. They're arriving at, at it from different ends. I don't think there's any question that's a kumbaya moment, but let's get more, <laughs> let's get back to the uh, teen employment issue, exactly uh, Paul. You. You're not going to hear any defense of, of corporate welfare for Boeing for us. In, in fact, Washington Policy Center has proposed ways to stimulate small business by cutting business taxes and improving their situation that way. Earlier, what I wanted to address was the question about where the power lies in this debate. And I just wanted to clarify, I don't think there's any doubt, certainly as a policy analyst and an economist, that the power lies with the government. The, the minimum wage, what the definition of it is, is that it is a price control. A minimum wage is price fixing, which is imposed by the force of law on the government by a unit of government, whether it's Congress or the city of Seattle or uh, um, the state of Washington. So it, it draws a line. Policymakers pick a number and they draw a line and they say below that line no one is permitted to work legally. Now, one thing that the minimum wage does is encourage the informal economy, the black market. But in the legal world, it says, we're, if someone offers you a job for $14.50, you are not allowed to take it. The voluntary agreement between a worker and an employer is interfered with by the power of the government. And, and just to close, with the 17-year-old would not be paid $15 an hour to work at any job. Their income, and for many uh, low-skilled workers, their income would drop to zero. Because from the employer's per point of view, if he is forced to pay $15 an hour, he's going to hire someone with more skills, more education, more experience. And that leaves poor people out. Ben, you want to add? Well, I mean, when it comes to the, we, we've heard a lot about the imbalance of power between, for example, employers and employees, people who have better education versus people who have less education. I can say with a, with a firm heart that the worst imbalance of power and the, and, the, and the most violative principle when it comes to consent is the idea that you're losing, so you bring in the guys with the guns to enforce your point of view is to pay. Uh, that seems to me the, 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 le the least voluntary system, which is exactly what minimum wage is. As far as teenagers, the reason that teenagers are not constituting a huge percentage of the people working at minimum wage is because they're all unemployed. The fact is that Washington State has an incredibly high teenage unemployment rate. And, and, uh, and when it comes to the, the minimum wage in the state of Washington, as we all know, the state of Washington has the highest minimum wage in the, in the nation. So there is a relationship with regard to teenagers. As far, look, in an ideal world, and, and we'll, I'm sure we'll get to this, I'm wondering what exactly the minimum wage should be. Why $15? Why not 35? Why not 55? Why not 100? If, if we are going to be ideologically consistent about all, the, all of this. Are you going to fight for a $50 minimum wage? I, I will fight right alongside you for, for $1,000 minimum wage because I want to see leftist policies implemented in the city so that people actually recognize what impact they have. Wow. Another vote for a $15 minimum wage. That's great, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, when it comes to $15 minimum wage, there's always, see, there's always a battle for conservatives in cities. It. Well, there's, still, there's always now, a hold, battle. Hold on, we're going to get to the next step. <laughs> this was uh, theoretically a question on teen employment. Right. 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 Now, just Council Member Sawat, did you have a final word on teen employment? What? They've brought up a lot of points. That All right, so let's, let's hold on. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be bringing up some of those points uh, coming up. So let's move on to the next question here. Uh, this is for you, Ben. Recently, the Seattle Times published a provocative column by Jasmine Donovan, granddaughter of the founder of the Seattle Burger Institution, Dick's Drive-Ins. You can cheer on that. <laughs> In the uh, column, she expresses a desire to see overall wages go up but fears harm toward those with lowest skills. As a compromise, she proposes a smart minimum wage. That, that's what she calls it, a smart minimum wage, one that would avoid a one-size-fits-all approach and go up according to educational skill and attainment. For example, if a high school dropout earned their GED, their minimum wage would go up. Is this the kind of compromise that you could support Ben Shapiro? No, because that's called the free market. Meaning that if you have better qualifications, then you will get paid more. It's why I went to Harvard Law School, so I get paid more than somebody who didn't go to Harvard Law School. I mean, that's just the way that the world works. The problem that we see in this entire debate, unfortunately, is that what we have on the one side is a recognition that people 
and, and maybe we blame God, maybe we blame cosmic circumstance for this. Some people are better qualified for jobs than other people. And so then the question becomes, is it the role of government to implement cosmic justice? Is it the role of government to come in and even all playing fields? That there's some people, look, I'm, I'm a 5'9", 150 Jewish guy. I'm never gonna play ball like Kobe Bryant. And it's something that makes me sad. Is, that, is it the role for government to come in and mandate that I make the same amount of money? I mean, this is, the, this is you know, as a general question, this is, this is the problem. It, conservatives are sort of stuck in between a rock and a hard place on this particular proposal. Because congratulations to Council Member Sawant, this has tremendous momentum. This, this, this $15 minimum wage has tremendous momentum. So you're seeing people come out and try to come up with compromise solutions. Uh, you know, should we come up with a graded, a, a graduated scale? Should we come up with something in between? Should we come up with something that we gradually implement, as the mayor has suggested? And, and, and the answer, I believe, from conservatives is no. You know, if we are going to, if we are going to have this debate, and if we are going to lose, then let's see how the policy plays out. And let's see if it plays out. If it plays out just as, as Council Member Sawant has suggested, then you know, maybe we'll all be happy and we'll go home happy at the end of the day. And if it doesn't, then maybe some people will get wise to how the economy actually works. So, <laughs> Paul, Paul, go ahead. So to add to that, again, from an economics point of view, that when a policymaker, or in this case, someone who's commenting on policy, suggests exemptions or exceptions to any across-the-board policy, it, when you do analysis, that usually indicates that there's a problem. These are Band-Aid approaches that are, makes you begin to question the overall principle. So, so what's your solution? Well, we can talk about that in a second. But in this case, when you talk about minimum wage or exempting small businesses or phasing it in over three years or seven years, those are all hints or indication that there's a problem with the overall concept. No, my, my the phase solution, in, so the phase in almost, almost, so my, okay, I can address that. So my solution would be to create a more a, a training wage. So I would allow someone in the first six months of their job to be paid a lower wage, which we now have for 15 and 16 year olds. I would expand that to, I would remove the age limit. I would say that there is no age limit on the training wage that currently exists in state law as step one. Step two, I would allow um, employers to have more flexibility about how they implement the wage. But the first thing I would do is not raise it so that employers can get used to the way it is now and that people are younger and lower skilled people are not priced out of the market because that's what the number does now. What about this idea of the uh, graduate wage based on, um, in the column, there's this concern about uh, the, the raising the minimum wage, particularly hitting those with the lowest skill, whose labor might not equal that $15 an hour. Council Member Sawant, how do you feel about this idea of the graduated kind of approach? Well, if you look at what's happening in the economy today, you know, today, uh, people, yeah, especially young people who have a lower educational attainment are already being done out of jobs because the economy, especially since the recession, is creating low-wage jobs. Two-thirds of the jobs that are being created are low-wage jobs. And necessarily, even uh, young people who have some college education, and it's in many cases college degrees, end up taking a lot of the jobs that used to be performed by uh, you know, people who had a high school education or maybe some community college education. So the reality is that we have to step back and take a macroeconomic viewpoint about this instead of, you know, getting down into the anecdotes and emotional arguments here. The reality is that uh, the minimum wage workers throughout the nation are better educated today than they were 40 years ago and they are lower paid if you look at the real value of the dollar. And so this idea that somehow education is going to solve the problem is flawed. The economy is not creating those jobs for higher education. There's lots of people with master's degrees and PhDs who are not able to get jobs that are equivalent to their skills. And why? That's not because they don't want good jobs, because the economy does not have enough of those jobs. And, and let's, let's look at the state of Washington. You know, there's a lot of conversation about how there's government regulation and that is the real problem. We are in a state which has the most regressive tax system in the entire nation. And that means what? That means that for corporations, for businesses, this is one of the most deregulated environments in the entire nation. So complaining about regulation in Washington state is like saying that Seattle is getting too much sun. You know, let, it's, let me it's stop a you there because we're, we're once again deviating away from the initial question, which was about the idea of if we're going to follow through with a $15 an hour uh, wage, should there be some kind of concession toward uh, the lower skilled or lower educated? Rebecca, did you want to weigh in on that? Well, I wanted to talk about the phase in because I, you know people are 
some folks here are talking as if we will have a $15 hour minimum wage for everybody in the city come July 1 or whatever. Typically, not, and in almost idea. every case, the minimum wage has been phased in. And that, there's a very good reason for that. It gives businesses the opportunity to not have a huge jump all at once, but to do it bit by bit and make the adjustments that they need to make in order to pay that minimum wage. Why do they need that? Don't they and have it has so they worked. Have idea. Hold and on, I, I, it has worked. Oh, hold on. What was what was the question? There? The question is, why do they need that? Don't they have Scrooge McDuck money bins that they go and swim the breaststroke in each night? I mean, that's, a, the, that's sort of the premise of this idea is that there are massive profits that are being earned by business that are not being passed along to workers. So why do they need the phase-in? If it's supposed to help the economy, if, if low-wage workers earning more helps the economy and creates a big economic boom, why not just do it? I mean, I thought that's the premise of 15 now. Well, the premise is now. that for those large businesses... <laughs> Large businesses should have to pay more quickly, and that's what's being done in other cities that are thinking about a $15 minimum wage. Chicago so voted later. a week or so ago. Well, one moment. Let's ask uh, Council Member uh, Sawant, because she's been uh, the most prominent in the 15 now, and Ben addresses the, uh, the fact that it's, it's now plus a little bit of extra time. Um, <laughs> And you, you have moved over personally a little bit in terms of being more flexible with smaller business and other things, and we're going to address that more fully a little bit later, but why don't you address that issue now as far as why are you more amenable to a phase-in for some businesses? Well, the reality is that when we, uh, were, when we came, we, we've been campaigning for $15 an hour for over two years now, and We've always said, I've always maintained that the, if small businesses and nonprofits need a little bit of time to you know, ease into it because they make a lower, small businesses make a lower margin of profits, a lot of small businesses are labor intensive, then they should actually be subsidized by taxing big corporations and the super wealthy. Okay. I mean, you, you have to be consistent. Either you're worried about small businesses or you're not. You know, you pick, you, 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 make, you make up your mind. If you're worried about small businesses, we have already talked about it. We're, talk, we're, we're talking about a phase in. If you're not worried about small businesses, come fight with me for 15 now. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. I want to do one follow up with the, uh, with the conservative side of the argument here. Ben was mentioning momentum. Uh, when it comes to the 15 now movement and uh, the perception of inevitability, the Seattle City uh, Council seems moved by Council Member Sawant's uh, election to uh, adopt essentially the same position, just with more, with less emphasis on the now, so to speak. Uh, ben was saying, uh, Paul, that he would rather see a full implementation and let the policy do what it what it what it does. Do you take the same approach, or do you see? A, uh, um, a need for a mitigating influence because of the impact on the lives of people. Well, sure. So, uh, so again, as a policy analyst, I mean, we, and I work with an independent think tank, so we see it as our job to propose policies that serve the public interest. And that's why I say not raising the minimum wage would be the best policy, because it creates opportunity as much as possible in the job market at nine. But you acknowledge that there was a problem. The, the whole event started with everybody acknowledging that there's a problem. So if there's a problem, then there should be a solution. And your solution and is doing nothing. And I'm coming to that. So, so right now our state our minimum wage is nine dollars and thirty-two cents, which is the highest minimum wage in uh, in the country. The the victims of that policy are those who cannot find jobs at any price because they are priced out of the job market entirely because of a law that's imposed by the state. In the House of Representatives in Olympia, which is dominated by Democrats, there was a bill to raise the minimum wage to twelve dollars an hour, and it failed. It didn't even come up for a vote. The governor did not push for it. And I'd say this because of the, um, uh, the point about momentum. So if Democrats who govern our state won't even vote on $12 an hour, I think that puts $15 an hour in trouble in Seattle also. Okay, now we're going to move on to the next question. Um, but I will say this, because the evening's progressing so quickly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give the person I asked the question to specifically one minute, and then I'll cut, cut and then uh, others will have 30 seconds to respond, okay, somewhere around there. 
Okay, so the next question for Councilwoman Sawant. In the same column in the Seattle Times, Jasmine Donovan pointed out that Dick's employees, the burger chain again, Dick's employees start at 10.25 an hour, receive merit raises, health insurance, 22,000 in scholarships over four years, child care assistance, bonuses, paid vacations, a 401k retirement plan with a 50% match, paid volunteer time at local charities and other benefits. She pointed out that employers can often purchase these benefits for far less than the individual employee could, meaning that if employees were to earn higher taxable wages but lose the valuable tax-free compensation, they may actually be worse off. Do you still hold that non-wage compensation should not count toward the $15 an hour objective? Well, I think if people are being honest with themselves, they would say that, they would see that for themselves, they don't want their uh, wage, uh, they don't want their higher wages. If they have a prospect of getting a higher wage, especially if you're a low wage worker, to that, for that to come at a cost of other benefits, because you know, you need wages, you ne also need health care. And I'm actually saying that, you know, uh, the costs of health care for small businesses are very high. That is why, if you're concerned about small businesses, you should be arguing for single-payer health care. But the, in, the, in the absence of that, because single-payer health care would, would put the burden of, as it should, of providing health care on the big corporations, not on small businesses. Actually, small businesses end up paying a lot out of pocket, the ones that do provide health care. But the reality is that you can't get, take your health care card and go to a coffee shop and buy a cup of coffee. You need dollars. You need actual money to be able to buy goods and services. So we're talking about apples and oranges. And rea in reality, by arguing for Time. this idea, you're talking about changing the definition of wage. Ben, you want to respond? Well, I mean, as far as the idea that, that small business would, would approve of, of single-payer health care, we can look to the thriving small business sector in Canada, Britain, and other socialized medicine countries, where small business clearly leads the way in their massive and growing economies. Uh, when, it, when it, you know, as far as the, you know, original question, uh, the, whether benefits should count in all of this, look, these, these should all be negotiated. This is why I'm, while, I, while I'm not a, a believer in public sector unions, I'm a big believer in private sector unions. This was the whole goal of having private sector unions. I mean, the rationale for having private Time. sector unions was not to bring in the government in order to adjudicate these disputes. It was supposed to be an agreement between the employees and the employers. Paula, Rebecca, would you like to weigh in? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies first. <laughs> this is sort of a boys against girls thing. I really like that. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, so, so I'm So we just lawyer. like children and women? I'm deeply, in, <laughs> <laughs> I'm deeply in touch with my feminine side making everything fair. You know, That's, I could tell that. I could tell right. that. Um, it's in the eyes. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lawyer and you can boo and hiss now, but for me, um, <laughs> I look at this uh, through the lens of enforcement and adding in all these other things would be an enforcement nightmare. First, whoever is trying to enforce the minimum wage would need to look at, you know, who, who got the bus pass, who accepted the child care, which of the workers got a free meal. Then they'd have to look at whether they voluntarily received those things. Then they'd have to look at what was the real value of the meal that the worker received. And then they'd have to figure uh. out how and when to count it. So, you know, if you get a bonus at the end of the year, Right now, you could call that someone's wages, but if employers want to put that bonus in every week's wage, then it's kind of not really a bonus anymore. It's their wage. Um, so if you want to hire 100 people at the city to go through everybody's records and try to figure out all of this stuff, then sure, that's the proposal for you. Paul? So, so again, going back to looking at it from an not from a lawyer's point of view, but from an economics point of view, is that the, the exceptions to public policy are symptoms of the weakness of that idea. Otherwise, why have the exceptions? So, so what, what employers would do, and this is why I think proponents argue for a phase-in, so that businesses, large and small, could adjust. Well, how are they going to adjust? They will adjust their costs by taking away benefits like those because the government has already ordered them to do something, uh, to um, set the number that they're going to pay on their wage, so businesses will cut back 
elsewhere, and they will also let workers go and deprive unskilled workers of opportunities. I mean, jobs disappear, and we can debate that. And I'll close quickly with this point, is that under uh, Obamacare, the employer mandate kicks in at 30 hours for an employee. So now 29 is the new 30. The way that people respond is they cut hours down to 29. To impose a mandate across the board, which is a price control on wages, employers look for other ways to adjust, if they can, including uh, ending job opportunities, moving to automation, going online, sending jobs overseas. They'll do anything they can to try to stay profitable and stay in business. Since 30 seconds uh, is rapidly becoming 50 to 60 seconds, <laughs> I will start saying time at 20 seconds in an effort to get to 30 seconds. Okay? <laughs> So we're going to move on to the next question here. Oh, man. Yeah. This is uh, to Paul Guppy. Is it moral to pay wages people cannot support a family on? Well, even the minimum wage doesn't, isn't designed to support a family. So I, I don't see that as a moral question in the sense that, that policymakers decide what number a family should get and then dictate that. And again, I think that's a basic philosophical difference. I think that people should have opportunity. The most important job that people have in their lives is their first job. So just getting over the bar into the labor market for graduates, for young people, for unskilled workers, for immigrants, just entering the working economy through the door at any price level is the most important step for them. And that leads to more skill, experience, and to higher wages further on. In other words, I think people want to earn it and gain as much as they can that way, rather than having it dictated by the government. Council Member Sawan, 30 seconds to respond to the idea of the morality of wages. I think that uh, if you are looking at your own lives, what you would like for your own families, for all your loved ones, what is it that you look for? You look for a decent standard of living. You look for good schools for your children, decent, good quality food, nutritious food, a safe neighborhood, uh, decent uh, housing to live in. You're looking for all these things. So are all those 100,000 workers who need something close to a living wage. And I really agree, you know, $15 an hour is not enough, but it is really disingenuous Time. to say that it's not enough and then not fight for something like 15 or even more. Rebecca, you want to weigh in? 30 seconds? People who work full time shouldn't have to live in poverty. That's it. Ben? Uh, people, people want a lot of things. You know, housing, health, you know, to live forever, a pony. I mean, there, there are a lot of things that we all want out of life. The reality is that there is no pony tree, which makes it difficult. So when, when, it, comes to the, when it comes to the morality of this, bottom line to me is, is it, it is not vicious, cruel, or immoral for me to make you an offer that you consensually accept. In fact, it is vicious, cruel, and immoral for someone who's a third party to, to get involved or for you to leverage a gun to get in the middle of that consensual relationship. Time. <laughs> moving, on to the, moving on to the next question, Rebecca Smith, one minute. How would you measure failure of a $15 an hour minimum wage uh, with the idea if you think there's a possibility of failure, how would you measure that failure? What kinds of things would you look for? Uh, what would have to occur for you to conclude that the 15 now policy was the wrong one? Well, we know that previous increases in the minimum wage have been successes. And we know that because there are studies that look at every single county from a state that has a higher minimum wage and one that has a lower minimum wage, including every county of Washington that is next to Idaho and every county that is next to Oregon when Washington's minimum wage was higher than those places. And what they, and what would you expect if you thought that the minimum wage would fail? You would think that there would be business closing, there would be, people would be fired or laid off, all these parade of horribles that we've heard over and over again. None of that has happened. The minimum wage has always, ha created this virtuous cycle where people get more money, they spend more money, businesses have more money, they hire more people. Time. Um, a Paul? <laughs> uh, I would definitely respond to that, and I think, because we've talked about whether uh, minimum wage um, contributes to unemployment. I think the macroeconomic effects that you're referring to are affected by larger forces in the economy. 
What's important is the unskilled person who can't find a job. So I actually refer to this as the hidden cruelty of a high minimum wage. It's the voiceless, the people who can't find a job who are at the lower end of the economy. They find that their opportunities are disappearing. And literally, their e income is reduced to zero, or they can't get that first job in the first place. So yes, a restaurant in Spokane County next to Time. Idaho, they can adjust. Um, but to wrap this up, but what we don't hear from are those who have a hard time or impossible to find a job in the first place. Council Member Sawan, is there anything that could happen uh, if the policy were implemented as you desire? Are there things that you would look for, benchmarks that would indicate to you that the policy w was not working? Once again, this you know this question is uh, is sort of in a, in a way it's meaningless because all the data shows that it is going to work, and there is no evidence to show that unskilled workers are disadvantaged. I mean, you're living under a rock if you think that that is going to happen because you're ignoring mountains of data. That's not something that an economist would do, and the reality is. Failure to me is if we wouldn't implement 15. If we didn't succeed in doing $15 an hour, that would be a failure. If we did a Swiss cheese 15, where most of the workers actually didn't get 15, but it was 15 in name only, that would be failure. We have to think about real people and Time. real lives. Ben? I have to say, I really, this, is, this is not meant sarcastic. This is meant perfectly honestly. I really do respect Councilwoman Sawant's consistency on this issue. No, really. I mean, because it'd be, it, I'm perfectly sincere, because for her, the morality of the situation outweighs whatever potential effects it has. And that's a perfectly reasonable position. It really is. Um, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to, you know, what could the bad effects be that would make it a failure as opposed to a success, this is what makes the debate so difficult, is the fact that you never see a counterfactual in exactly the same scenario. You can compare the neighboring counties in Idaho versus Washington, but there are state politics in Idaho versus Washington that are incredibly different. And the populations are not necessarily the same. Time. And, and so the, 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 the idea of trying to come up with the exact same evidence, it, it, there's no control group, in, in other words. In any scientific study, you need a control group. And virtually every city across the nation is different in, in terms of ethnic, economic, educational breakdown. All right, next question for Ben Shapiro. Even Milton Friedman recognized that in subsistence economies, until you reach the point where you could produce enough to provide for basic needs for your family, a little gain could be made. In the modern world, we have new subsistence levels, and at low wages, people still struggle to pay for basic food, shelter, rent, water, and power, leaving them with little money or time to get ahead. You have had the advantages of parents who are professionals and a Harvard education. Wouldn't giving $15 an hour minimum uh, simply be giving many people a little space so they could create the opportunities for themselves that you have already had the advantage of? Well, I mean, I have had advantages of, uh, of birth in, in the sense that I grew up in, in a bedroom with uh, three younger sisters in a house with one bathroom, which made waiting a long time. Um, but it's, it, uh, but the, the reality is that when you look at, at you know, what makes somebody potentially an economic success in the United States, basically you only need a couple of factors. You don't have kids before you get married, you get a regular job, and you graduate high school. That's pretty much it. You will be able to rise in the work world in the United States if you do these three things. The decisions that you make will have a massive income, impact on your future income and on your economic situation because values have a massive impact on your income and future situation. If we really want to guarantee future growth and employment for people, we have to make sure that higher level jobs are there. We can create either an economy with an enormous level of low level and low wage jobs or we can have an economy in which growth from position to position is actually possible. When my great grandparents came here, they didn't speak any English and they didn't know any job skills and, and my grandmother was able to you know put, put a sock away a lot of money and build her own home that's the American dream what is not the American dream is living at subsistence levels barely subsistence levels for the foreseeable future for your entire life council member Sawant, do you want to respond uh, to the idea that Ben brought up that um, that values and choices are going to impact your uh, potential for wages Sorry, what, what uh, do you want to respond to Ben's point that values and choices that you make in your life will impact your ability to earn wages? Well, obviously nobody is going to deny that you know there is some aspect of personal responsibility and personal choices. But let's look at the real choice that we are talking about. This is the choice between working at a low wage job, working lots of hours and making barely anything to get by, and starving. That's the choice we're talking about. This is a false choice. You know, we need a little bit of honesty in this discussion here. And if we're talking about, you know, anecdotal evidence versus statistical evidence, 
there's lots of stories you can think about, you know, rags to riches stories. But the systematic evidence of the United States is that it's the least mobile society of the rich developed countries. Time. And wealth and poverty. Is it okay if I finish? Yeah, finish the point. Folks, please. Wealth and poverty are intergenerational. I mean, you can choose to close your eyes to the facts or you can choose to open your eyes to the facts and, you know, learn that we cannot really defend an indefensible system. I am making the choice to not defend an indefensible system, and I'm proud of doing that. Rebecca? The fact is, these are the jobs that are being created in our economy, and I think we talked about that earlier, but you know, this has been going on for a long time. We're losing manufacturing jobs. We're losing construction jobs. During the recession, two-thirds of the jobs that were lost were mid-wage. Two-thirds of the jobs that were created were low-wage. And that's how it's going to go. That's what the projection is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So we need to make those good jobs. Time. And we need... Ah. <laughs> Paul? Yeah. You can finish. <laughs> I, I, I just want to talk a little bit about who's in these jobs as well. It's not the teenagers. In Seattle, and you know, we had the University of Washington, we as all of us in Seattle, had the University of Washington take a look at that. These are adults, two-thirds, well about 58% have some college education. They're working full-time, they're working harder than ever and falling farther behind. Paul, you're a gentleman and yielded 15 <laughs> seconds of your Thank time. Thank you. So you go right ahead. <laughs> I'll just make two quick points. The first is I think we have to recognize that we have a federal program already to help uh, low-income working people that supplements their income, and that's the Earned Income Tax Credit, which all of us as taxpayers contributed to. That program did not exist when Milton Friedman made that comment about subsistence economy. So I think we need to recognize we have policies, which I actually think are more effective because they're targeted to work to helping low-income working people, and they apply across the board so they don't create distortions in our economy. And then the second point is uh, you can talk about income mob mobility and whether um, America has more opportunity than other places, but the key to getting ahead anywhere economically is to get the first job. And a high minimum wage sets that bar that prices a lot of people out of the job market. Okay. Next question. <laughs> Councilwoman Sawant, in the United States, uh, even poorer households tend to have televisions, modern appliances, and an automobile. Uh, we even have an obesity problem. U.S. GDP per capita is 33 times higher than that of India. Yet it's been reported that you have said that you see poverty in America as worse than poverty in India. Do you hold to that view? And if so, why should we adopt your perspective on poverty? Well, that is a misquote and taken out of context. What I said and what I've consistently said, as Ben said, I'm consistent. What I have said <laughs> is that it is absolutely stunning that in the country that is the wealthiest country in the history of humanity, wealthy beyond any imagination, you have so much poverty that people are getting pushed and pu pushed lower and lower in a race to the bottom. That is what is stunning. You want to think about poverty, it makes sense to think about it in the context. So the context is, and this is not just in the US, this is globally, the context is that you have more and more billionaires being created and more and more people who used to be in the middle class being pushed into further into poverty. This is the reality of the United States. I mean, that's why you have 70% you know, businesses acknowledge this. The one uh, Seattle coalition that was uh, uh, created by big business acknowledged this yesterday, that 70% of Seattleites strongly favor a $15 minimum wage because they recognize that the economy as it is currently uh, situated is not working for the vast majority of Americans despite the incredible wealth that the workers are creating. Ben, you want to respond? I mean, as you know, as far as the idea that, that America suffers from tremendous poverty problems, I, I think that the that the the statistics that you were citing that you know the, virtually everybody who's living at the poverty line has a TV. The huge percentage have air conditioning. A huge everyone has a refrigerator. Everyone has a microwave. These are testaments to the fact that and these are these are statistics from the bureau of the. I mean, these these are from the government. These are not statistics that I'm citing simply from the, from the Heritage Foundation. Uh, the, the, the idea that the, that the poor in this country are anywhere near the poor in a place like India, of course, is, is ridiculous. I, I hope that's not the point that, 
that Councilwoman Sawant was making, and so we'll take you know, what she says here at face value. Um, as far as the uh, as far as the, the general perspective on the economy, it's, it's very it's very depressing. One sentence: it, it is a very depressing point of view to suggest that all of the jobs are being are being da damned essentially to the lowest common denominator, and therefore we have to turn those jobs into good jobs. That's a, that's a very pessimistic view of where the economy is going, and you can do that, but it's going to enshrine this as the the mainstay of the American economy. The burger flipping job is the mainstay of the American economy from here to the end of time. Real quickly, Paul. Uh, would you address the, the point uh, Councilmember Sawant made about the middle class disappearing into, and yeah, becoming so, poor? So again, just from an analyst point of view, uh, this is a comment about statistics and measuring. So over the decades, the government has changed the way that they measure poverty in America. So air conditioning, automobile, television are common. Not everybody has them, but they're common in our context. Uh, the definition for the poverty line that the federal government has now for a family is about $24,000 a year in our country, whereas millions of people live in the world on $2 a day. So there's just a different context when we're debating poverty in the United States compared to what it is globally. Even Time. so, the, the solution f from terms of what I think pol public policy makers and our government should be doing is creating as much opportunity and choice as possible for people to get started on the ladder towards work and income. Rebecca? I think we agree on that. Wow, that was fantastic. <laughs> you, guys are, you guys are just splitting your time up I'm, I'm paying you back. I'm paying them back for the 15 <laughs> <Excellent>. seconds. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You guys should have been sitting right next to each other, I guess. Okay. I want to be able to get to uh, audience questions. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I have questions, uh, some additional questions for you directly. Um, I'll limit response to one person of the opposition. So it'll be one minute uh, to the specific person, then one person from the opposition. We'll have 30 seconds to respond. Then we'll move to the next round and alternate uh, the, the person. So next question for Paul Guppy. Polls have shown widespread public support for an increase in the minimum wage, it was just alluded to, including overwhelming support amongst Republicans. Paul Guppy, doesn't this indicate a bipartisan consensus that an increased minimum wage would help workers and the economy? Yeah, so the minimum wage is popular. I think that as long as it's seen as being reasonable and incremental, which reduces the harm that it does across the economy. But one thing about it is that it's, it's always easy to pass a law that forces someone else to pay money to a third party. So when the public is asked about the minimum wage, they're not asking, should we raise your taxes? Are we creating a program that you're going to pay for? It's saying, should corporations and employers and businesses pay more money to workers? It's a kind of popularity question, and people are going to tend, tend to say yes. To me, the real key in politics is, let's have a roll call vote in it. And our legislature in March had that opportunity in the Democratic-controlled House, as I mentioned, and that bill didn't even get out of committee. So to me, that indicates something about how lawmakers think about this proposal. Rebecca, you want to take 30 seconds to respond? Well, yeah, and the minimum wage in Congress hasn't been raised for, um, let me see, half a dozen years, and we're stuck at 213 for the tipped wage. I mean, I don't think the measure of success of a policy idea is whether it's passed um, the legislature, particularly not the federal legislature at this point. Um, it is incredibly popular, and it's incredibly popular because it works, and it's incredibly popular among Republicans, Time. and it's incredibly popular among people who are employees, but employers vote too. Councilmember Sawan, I saw you jumping at the bit there to say <laughs> something about that, so 15 seconds, want to say anything? Okay. Next question, uh, Councilmember Sawan, is the problem income inequality, or is it that some people are poor? Those two problems are indistinguishable because poverty is not something that comes as an act of God or is it something that happens in a vacuum. Poverty is the result of the incredible consolidation of wealth at the top. And how is that wealth created? Wealth is created by people going to work every single day, creating value, producing value. And that value is then, then, then has to be sold to consumers, and who are those consumers? The vast majority of the products need to be bought by ordinary working people who are using their paychecks to buy those. So really, the question that we're asking about poverty 
in, in the uh, context of incredible wealth is what income inequality is. So, you know, if you look at hunter-gatherer societies many, many, many thousands of years ago, and if you compare their standard of living to ours, yes, they appear poor compared to us. But the reality is that they were equal. You know, they were all, it was, it was in the context of the technological level at that time. Today, when if people are not able to solve their basic needs, pay for their basic needs, Time. that is happening in the context of incredible wealth, and they are being deprived of that. So income inequality and poverty go hand in hand. Ben Shapiro. Again, I'll praise Council Member Sawan's consistency on this, praising hunter-gatherer equal societies over modern society's inequality. Uh, the, the idea that um, there's a reason that our unequal society is vastly more wealthy at the bottom rung than hunter-gatherer societies. The reality of the situation is that the economy is not a fixed pie. If the economy were a fixed pie, then we would still be eating outside, beating each other with rocks, and trying to roast our food over small fires. The reality of the situation is that the economy grows because people engage in consensual transactions and people invent new things in order to engage in more of those consensual transactions. That's not an impoverishing thing. The truth is that socialism is the most selfish philosophy on planet Earth because it is based on the, the essential concept that I am breathing, therefore I deserve. Capitalism is, in essence, forced altruism because if I don't give you something that you want, then I will starve. If I don't give you something that you want, then I will starve because it is based on consent, whereas socialism is based inherently on force. Next, next question. Next question uh, to Rebecca. What happens if someone's labor isn't worth $15 an hour? I would just ask the same question I asked before, and I got a bad response, but I'm going to just say it again. Worth is really based on power. Um, if you have the power to demand a higher wage, you're going to get a higher wage. And that's why the CEO of Walmart gets $20 million a year. Do you really think he's worth that? And I know you're going to say yes, but I just can't believe that. No, let me just address that because you've mentioned it twice. <laughs> so the, the, the CEO of Walmart gets $20 million a year from the board of Walmart or whoever hands that out. But the point is that that decision is voluntary. So the Congress didn't pass a law that says what the CEO's uh, salary is. If the board of Walmart thinks that he's worth $20 million, then it's their money. They give him $20 million. It's a voluntary decision. So And, and also, I should say that living in, in Seattle, uh, Living with rich people and millionaires has never bothered me at all. So we have McCaw Hall, we have Benaroya Hall, uh, the True Family Cancer Center, and you know, living with wealthy people as your neighbors is not necessarily a bad thing. Okay, time. By the way, unless you, unless you live in North Korea, which is a socialist country, and you live next to Kim Jong-un, then it is bad to live next to the wealthy guy. <laughs> This question is for Ben Shapiro. Ben, uh, more than half the minimum wage earners in Seattle are over the age of 25. Does this indicate that your description of the minimum wage as a startup wage is out of date? Um, well, it, it, yes. I mean, to a certain extent, because the reality is that for a lot of folks, it is not a startup wage. That's a failure of our educational system. That's a failure of our legal system. It's a failure of our regulatory system. The reality is that, that there, there are a lot of folks who have graduated college who are now working minimum wage jobs, thanks in part to the growth of government. The reality of the situation is that for all these people, this, the same folks who praise Bill Clinton's wonderfully growing government seem to neglect the fact that Bill Clinton's government spends about $2.6 trillion a year, and our current government spends $4 trillion a year. The, if, if you want to have a growing economy, if you want the minimum wage job not to be the default job, then what you have to do is create incentive again for people to engage in precisely those services that more people want because that creates more jobs and better products for you to have. I don't want a world in which everybody has a Blackberry from three years ago. I would like a world in which everybody has the opportunity to buy an iPhone 12 because that means that 100% of the population is going to be able to afford that Blackberry from three years ago. This is why you have progress in the economy as opposed to the stagnant but more equal economy suggested by our county. Counterparts. Um, Council Member Sawant, you want to respond for 30 seconds? Well, most low-wage jobs don't offer mobility. So this idea that you know fast food jobs or other low-wage jobs are a starting point for a brilliant working career is a complete myth. Most people who work in low-wage jobs are stuck there because they have nowhere else to go. And all these 
all these wonderful virtues that are being extolled by our folks sitting next to us here about capitalism, you know, about all these services, about blackberries and God knows what else. Who is going to buy all these products? Not a single cent of profits Time. is created unless there are buyers for your products. And billionaires can buy only so much of it. You rely on a vast majority of consumers to buy those products in order to turn a profit. And yet you say these companies are earning incredibly massive profits, so clearly somebody's paying for them. One more question for they a council member of Salant. They are. They this, are. This next question is they actually are, they to are Council Member Salman. Profits, but the system is inherently contradictory, and that is why you had a massive recession. Massive recessions are written into the DNA of the capitalist system because it reaches a point where there aren't enough buyers for all this production, and then the system goes bust, and then it has to recover from there, and $15 an hour is a part of that solution. Okay. Final question from me, then we're going to go to a uh, rapid fire round of audience questions. This is for Council Member Sawant. Uh, in the report for the City of Seattle's Income Inequality Committee, it was estimated that increasing the minimum wage to 1212 would achieve three fourths of the total poverty reduction that could be accomplished with a full $15 an hour wage. I should note here that the study estimates did not account for any possible adjustments in employment or businesses. Council Member Sawant, after, after hearing small business concerns, even you have modified your stand to allow some smaller businesses a three-year phase-in period. If three-quarters of your objectives are achieved with 1212 12 uh, as the wage, why risk the business stability and why not compromise at the lower wage? What is the need for compromise when you, you, when you see that data consistently indicates that small businesses are actually not hurt by an increase in the minimum wage. I mean, all, this, all these uh, uh, ideas that are reverberating around this room, they exist only in this room among these people, this audience. The reality does not match up. The reality does not match up. So that's why I said, you know, you can choose to look at the facts or you can choose to be buried under a rock. It's your choice. Quick, quick, uh, quick follow-up. Quick follow-up before we have a response. Um, you had mentioned earlier, the, and you have mentioned before in public, the $15 an hour is the first step. What is the second step or the third step? Well, you know, $15 an hour, first of all, as we said, it's not enough of a wage, but it is a substantial improvement, and this is what workers have put forward. Fast food workers themselves courageously took their lives into their own hands, walked out of their jobs in a one-day strike in New York City, and demanded $15 an hour. And that is the first step because the economy is not going to remain static. We have to fight for affordable housing. We have to fight for better services in terms of mass transit, education, healthcare. And that is why we have to also talk about taxing the super wealthy and big corporations. OK. So more on economics, because this point has been brought up a couple of times about how if workers have more money, then they spend more, and that creates productivity or creates more uh, prosperity in our economy. And actually, what creates prosperity in our, our economy is economic growth and productivity. So simply ordering employees to pay a higher uh, minimum wage, whether it's $15 or $12, raises the economic question of where does that money come from. The employers don't print it in the basement. They have to get it from somewhere. So what it creates, uh, so what creates our prosperity and opportunity for all workers is economic growth. And economic growth comes from greater productivity of millions of people making decisions in the economy, workers and employees, individually deciding what works best for them. And that's where a government policy interferes. Time, Ben, looks like you have a 15 second uh, something. Well, I mean, uh, of course one government policy leads to the next. If you raise the minimum wage, then it's going to raise the rents. When it raises the rents, you're going to have to build affordable housing. When you have to build affordable housing, you have to tax people to build the affordable housing. When you tax people to build the affordable housing, people move out of the city, and you have to raise taxes on the people who remain in the city, and this is how you hollow out the economy of a major metropolitan area in the United States. Only, uh... The problem... The problem is that think, our economy uh, is already hollowing out. We're creating huge wealth at the top, and the rest of us are losing ground. And the people at the bottom, who are, by the way, more productive than ever, are losing even more ground. When, when was the last if the time minimum wage had again? kept if the minimum wage had kept pace with the productivity of workers, it'd be around, I think it's $17 an hour. Okay, so maybe we should be talking about that. Let's move to the uh, audience questions. I'm going to ask a question. 
Um, let's see, we'll have either side respond, but we'll only have one person from each side because we're almost uh, through with the evening and I want to get through as many of these as possible. Uh, so if you are really hankering to address the question, uh, be eager and be first, okay? <laughs> Total, total compensation has entered the debate for the $15 an hour minimum wage, which would include and deduct from wages benefits that employers claim. How would we control for wage theft since it is already rampant in Washington state? We could not. Wage theft would be even more rampant, and we would not ever be able to enforce a $15 hour minimum wage. Wage theft is already affecting low wage workers to the tune of about a quarter of people not getting minimum wage in a week, and about three quarters of people not getting overtime pay for overtime work. So, yeah, real quickly, go ahead. Let me tell you something. The only reason that total compensation and tip credit, these things are being talked about by businesses is because they can't fight the idea of 15 anymore. The, the mandate, public mandate is so strong for $15 an hour. They are going to look really obscene if they oppose 15 openly, which is what they really want to do. And that's why they're coming up with these ideas to hollow out the $15 an hour idea so that they don't actually have to pay $15 an hour. Paul? Okay, well, I openly and courageously oppose it right here. The, <laughs> again, from, but when you Easy do... for you to be courageous here. Or, or anywhere. I mean, I'll debate this issue Paul lives with in you Seattle. Yeah. At, at any location yeah. that you want to choose, and I'll be there. Um, again, from a policy analyst's point of view, the more complicated the policy is, the more exceptions there are, the indication is that it's probably a weak idea and doesn't serve the public interest. So the, the complexity of the wage laws, the more mandates there are, we're seeing this with health care too, the more difficult it is for the government to enforce, and that contributes to wage theft. If the laws were simpler, then people would know what their rights are, and it's harder for them to be cheated by unscrupulous employers. Sounds like you oppose total compensation then, right? Total compensation is an like indicator of the weakness of the original idea. So you wouldn't need phase-ins or exceptions or uh, tip m money if the, if the mandate weren't imposed in the first place, or at least if that number were not so high. Let's move to the next question. Why spend so much time trying to force employers to pay more when you could put this effort toward keeping earned money in taxpayers' pockets by lowering our ridiculous taxes? Councilmember Solomon. Good idea. It is true that Washington state has the most regressive tax system, as I said earlier. So what does that actually mean? It means that households that make less than $20,000 pay a year pay 17% of taxes, and the super wealthy pay only 2.8% in taxes. <laughs> Boeing, Boeing, Microsoft, Amazon.com, all these big corporations effectively pay negative tax rates. So if you want to fight for higher taxes on big business and lower taxes on households, I'm right with you. Let's do it together. Ben? Ben? Again, we're getting into other issues, so fine, I'll mention this. There is one entity which reduces all of our take-home pay, and that's the government. So Seattle has a sales tax that's almost 10%. Seattle has one of the highest property taxes in the country, and renters pay the property tax. So one thing that policymakers could do in a very simple, targeted way would be to reduce the financial burden that they impose on all of us, and that would increase take-home pay for everybody. Next question, why stop at a single flat minimum wage in a particular jurisdiction and not expand to dictating certain minimums according to education, age, uh, zip code of residence, etc. from John in Seattle? Well, the fact is that workers everywhere in the nation need a higher minimum wage and workers everywhere are inspired by what's happened so far in Seattle, and all eyes are in Seattle, are on Seattle. Workers everywhere are feeling empowered by how much workers in Seattle are fighting for their rights. So it has nothing to do with Seattle zip code. We need this to happen everywhere, but what's wrong with starting with Seattle? It's true, you might say that workers of the world, for lack of a better word, are unite, are uniting. Um, you know, as, 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 far as, as far as the... Uh, as it's easy to make facetious comments. It's, easy to, it's very hard to dispute data. Well, since you provided no data in that actual answer, it's not that difficult. As far as the as as, as far as as far as the, the as far as the notion that that you know, the, that workers embrace a fifteen dollar minimum wage, the real question was, and this is the real question: Who knows better what should be the result of a consensual bargain between two parties? Somebody who is completely unrelated to that bargain, or either of the parties, 
or the two parties who are involved. When an employer and an employee decide to make a consensual relationship together, I mean, it, it's incredible that the minimum wage debate actually reverses itself when it comes to gay marriage, but when it comes to, or, or, sa or same-sex relationships in so many cases, the, 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 the concept being that consent is of the highest value for many members of the left, except when it comes to economic relationships, at which point it goes completely out the window. At that point, then government gets to step in whenever it pleases, because people know better than anybody else how a business should be run. So this really becomes the question is why not and, and and really this is the key question i think maybe the entire night why at what point is economic inequality solved why not just pay everybody the same amount regardless of the job that they do and we can have the government nationalize all business in order to accomplish this why not just do that that would be economic equality at its finest otherwise you are sanctioning economic inequality of some level or another so why not well, it sounds like Ben is arguing for democratic socialism there for a second. Well, I'm asking you why you're not arguing for democratic socialism. I do argue for democratic socialism. Then why fifteen dollars? But why the reality is, the reality is that you know, I mean, look, if we're having a serious discussion about how to address income inequality, then we have to understand that we cannot, we we have to look at where people are what workers really are fighting for. And these questions about what political demand should we make today, whether we should call for $15 an hour or $50 an hour, is really a political question. You know, workers are going to, are going to have to come out in mass movements like they've started to do in Seattle and other cities to fight for their rights. That is when social change happens. And for workers to have for workers to be able to do that, they need a feeling that they can actually win a demand. $15 an hour is something that workers have decided that is, this is actually going to bring about a substantive increase in their standard of living, and it is something winnable. But we are not saying that $15 is enough, but $15 is necessary as a starting point. So in the, so in the end, you're, you're a pragmatist. It's just a question of how pragmatic you think your plan is as opposed to the mayor's. So it's not, it's not an ideologically consistent position after all. It's just pragmatism. The ideology that we are talking about is fighting for the rights of workers. And those demands that we put forward in order to fight for workers are not etched in stone. You know, uh, in the past, we had to fight for women's right to vote. We had to fight against child labor. We had to fight for civil rights. We had to fight for the rights of black people and the gay community, and those fights still go on. And these fights have to be waged on many, many different fronts. So it's really, uh, it's intellectually dishonest to say that this is just about 15, or this is somehow inconsistent with the rest of what we are saying. $15 an hour is part of the entire gamut of rights that we have to fight for. Rebecca. <clears throat> I've forgotten the original question, but if you would like to uh, weigh in Actually, here. Actually, <laughs> as have I, but that doesn't mean I don't have Whatever anything comes to, to say. Mind, work. Sure. <laughs> I just want to go back to this question of consent because our friends over here keep bringing up this consensual relationship between a worker and an employer. And, you know, consent is really only possible if people are in an equal situation of power. So you need someone how to many, people? How many folks go to get a job and tell their employer what it is they want for a starting wage? No one. <laughs> Virtually no one. How many people? That is false. Every, every, single, every single employee in the United States well, does that you know, because they have the choice to take the job or it's not. It's really great that all of you are, have that, that much power with your employers, but how many fast food workers go in and are able to say, I want $10, $12 an hour? No, they are offered a starting wage. They get a starting wage just like everyone else hold on, on hold the on. job. Let me, let and me, it's take it or leave it. They can say it. They just Please, may not let me it. interrupt. Let me, let me interrupt here and, uh, and uh, propose something that perhaps everyone can agree on, and that is uh, I am very grateful for all of you for showing up tonight. How about a big round of applause for all of our panelists? <laughs> Particularly our panelists on the left for showing up to a tough audience. Thank you all so much for coming and for listening to the station and supporting your side, and we look forward to the next event. Thank you. <laughs>